Hello students, and welcome to today's lesson on the attributes of reciprocal functions. Our objective today is that we will list the attributes of reciprocal functions using our journal notes and practice problems. First, we need to define a couple of things. So first, I'd like to define an asymptote. So an asymptote is a line that continually approaches a given curve but never touches it. So we can have a couple of different types of asymptotes. This is going to be a horizontal asymptote. And we can also have a vertical asymptote, which is going to be a similar situation, except that now I've got this vertical line here. And I'll have some curve which approaches it but never touches it. So this curve, these smooth curves, are going to continually approach these imaginary lines, but they can never cross those imaginary lines. Now, now knowing about asymptotes, I can start to distinguish between continuous functions and discontinuous functions. So a continuous function is a function whose points exist in a smooth curve. And every point is a small distance away from the next. And when I say small, I mean extremely small, as in there can be almost no gap between those two points. So this small distance is much smaller than we're used to dealing with. Um, so a continuous function, a good example of it might be our parabola, right? If we have our function here and we just draw a parabola, that's going to be a nice, smooth, continuous function. Um, an example of something that is not a continuous function would be our stepwise function. So if I've got these steps here, this is not a continuous function because we have all these gaps here that are being created. All right, and now let's define discontinuous functions. Well, a discontinuous function is any function which is not continuous. And you can have different types of discontinuity. Uh, there are jump discontinuities. There are uh, things that have an asymptote in them. And we'll get into those later. So any function which is not continuous, um, it might be um, a jump discontinuity. It might be a hole, or it might even be uh, the fact that you have like an asymptote. And branches. And we'll get into what branches are in just a second here. All right, so these definitions are going to be very important for us going into our attributes of reciprocal functions. So these, vo you can see this is a very vocabulary heavy lesson, and this will be a pretty vocabulary heavy unit. We're getting into real analysis at this point, so we're starting to actually analyze things uh, in a precise way. All right, so let's go ahead and actually analyze the reciprocal function and see what its attributes are. All right, so f of x is equal to 1 over x is the parent function for reciprocal functions. It is an inverse variation between two variables. And like you said, or like we learned the other day, is that our inverse variation is going to follow a set pattern. So if we're going to graph this, what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to develop two tables here. So I'm going to develop a positive table and a negative table. So this will be the same function, except here I'm going to use positive inputs, and on the other side I'm going to use um, 
inputs that are not positive. So this will be x, and this will be 1 over x, and then this will be x, and this will be 1 over x. So for my positive inputs, I'm going to go ahead and start at 0, and then I'll do 1 over 4, then I'll do 1 over 2, then I'll do 2, and I'll do 3, and then I should be done there. And then over here, I'm going to do uh, 0 will be my very last point, and I'll do negative 1 over 4, negative 1 half, then I'll do negative 2 and negative 3. All right, so let's go ahead and put our inputs in. So if I put 0 into 1 over x, well, 1 divided by 0, I can't do that. So this is undefined. So there is no point that exists at 0. So 0, 0, it, which is normally our origin, is actually not going to do anything for us right now. Our 1 fourth, when we plug this in, we get 1 divided by 1 over 4. But we know that dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So I say 1 times the reciprocal of 1 fourth will be 4 over 1, so that's going to give me 4. So this will be 4. And then 1 half, same thing will happen, where it will give me the reciprocal. That'll be 2. And then I plug in 2, and I get 1 over 2. And I plug in 3, and I get 1 over 3. Then for the negatives, I do the same thing. So 0, again, is going to be undefined. I plug in negative 1 over 4. This becomes negative 4. This becomes negative 2. This becomes negative 1 half. And this becomes negative 1 third. So as you can see, the reciprocal function is named very appropriately because all of my inputs, when I put them in, the, my output is the reciprocal of my input. So that's interesting. All right, let's go ahead and graph these points. So 0 is undefined. Then I go to 1 fourth and 4. So I'm going to just try and approximate this as good as possible. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's maybe about there. Then I go to 1 half, and it's at 2. So I go a little bit further, and I have a point there. Then I go to 2, and I'm at 1 half, so that'll be here. And then I go to 3, and I'm at 1 third already. And we can see the pattern that's happening here, is that we're kind of making this nice, smooth, continuous curve here that approaches our axes, but it'll never quite touch them. And what we'll see is that a, a reflection of this will actually occur in quadrant 3. So this is quadrant 1, and then our other points will actually be graphed in quadrant 3. All right, so we see that uh, negative 1 fourth will give us negative 4. Negative 1 half will give me 2. And then I go to uh, negative 2 will give me negative 1 half, and then negative 3 will give me negative 1 third. And we see a similar pattern occurring here. All right, so this is my parent function. Now what's interesting about this is that we, we start to analyze this and we want to look for our range and domain. And we notice that there's this interesting restriction on our range and domain. It looks as though there are two lines which my function approaches but never touches. And it's my x-axis and my y-axis. We can also write our x-axis as y equals 0 and my y-axis as x equals 0. So we approach the lines x equals 0 and y equals 0, but we never touch them. Hmm, what are those called? Oh, asymptotes. So this is going to be my horizontal asymptote. And this is going to be my vertical asymptote. All right, and then using that, I can actually fill in everything that I need to do. So what we'll see is that my domain, well, it looks as though I can be every single number except for 0. So my domain is going to be expressed in this way. We're going to say that it's x belongs to r such that x is not 0. Another way that you can write this is just that x cannot equal 0. And this is related to my vertical asymptote because we see that 
x cannot be zero is the same thing as my vertical asymptote. So x equals zero was my vertical asymptote, and that tells me the one number that my x cannot be for my domain. So let's see if we can figure out the range using the same idea. So my range is all my y values, and I know that my horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals zero. So that means in my range, I'm going to write it as y belongs to real numbers such that y cannot equal zero. Or another way that I could write this is y cannot equal zero. All right, so that's how we determine our range and domain, is looking at our, um, at our horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Now, x-intercepts and y-intercepts. You notice that we approach our lines, but we never touch them. So what we're going to say here is that there is no intercept. Because we approach our axes, but we never quite touch them. So at first, this function looks a lot more complicated than what you're used to, right? You have these pieces out here. It has more than one piece. And actually, these pieces are called the branches. because the function can be kind of separated into two distinct pieces, so we call them branches. Um, so we have these branches. It seems really complicated, but luckily, it's actually pretty easy to graph these. So our transformations are going to be the exact same transformations that we've seen before, except now our parent function is 1 over x. So if I have a k, if k is greater than 0, it shifts up. If k is less than 0, it shifts down. The same thing will happen here. I've got h, right? And if h is greater than 0, it goes right. And if h is less than 0, it'll go left. And remember, this happens because your sign in here is negative. Therefore, a positive h will not change the sign, right? So if I have a negative h, it'll change the sign. It'll look like a plus in here. So you have to be careful about this one. A positive h will leave a minus in the actual equation. A negative h will change it to be a positive. All right, then our stretch and compression will follow all the same rules. So if a is greater than 0 and also less than 1, then it's a vertical stretch, sorry, vertical compression. So that's if a is a fraction, it'll be a compression. And then if a is greater than 1, it's a vertical stretch. And then finally, we have our plus or minus. And that'll just tell us if we get reflected. So this is a... Teachers, at this time, please go to... I apologize for that interruption. Uh, so if you have a vertical... If you've got this plus or minus, it's going to be reflection. over the horizontal asymptote. All right, and then what we'll see is uh, it'll look something like this. So instead of being in quadrant 1 and 3, it'll be in quadrants 2 and 4. So that's how the reflection will look there. All right, so your reflection today is how are reciprocal functions similar to other functions that we have studied? How are they different? Your assignment for today is that you will ask me for a stamp um, for your reflection and then begin working on 11-2 assignment. Now, I will be posting another homework help video later today where I'll do some practice problems. So be on the lookout for that if you're doing your homework tonight and you need some additional help. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.